Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we are now continuing to hear from the next keynote speaker. Here with us today, Professor Dr. Richard Milham from Durban University of Technology, South Africa. Dr. Ida Hama from Institute Technology, 10 November, will moderate these sessions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Richard Milham and Dr. Ida Hama. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Prof Yap and esteemed colleagues of SCDS for having me. Um, I, I, my name is Richard Millam from the Durban University of Technology in Durban, South Africa. I'd uh, like to share with, uh, with you uh, a bit, bit of the work uh, that I'm doing. Uh, the uh, title of my presentation is called The Use of Bio-Inspired Algorithms for Intelligent Energy Management of Renewable Energy Resources. We have all heard about uh, climate change and the, the move to renewable energy resources to replace fossil-based um, energy resources, which has resulted in uh, climate warming. Uh, I'm um, sorry, Prof. And, Richard, I interrupt you. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Irhama will introduce you first to the participant, and then afterward you start your presentation. Okay, sorry for that. Okay, please, okay. Dr. My, Irhama. My, yeah. my apologies, sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, Professor. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon to our distinguished guests, keynote speakers, a committee, presenter, and participant, and especially for our keynote speaker, Professor Richard. I would like to welcome you all to the sixth uh, session of keynote speaker in the sixth international conference of soft computing in data science. And first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Irhama from Institute Technology, 10 November, Surabaya in Indonesia, and I will be the moderator for this session. In this occasion, we'd like to have a speech from Professor Richard Milham. Hello, Professor. And we are very happy to have you here. And before the presentation begins, please allow me uh, to introduce our speaker. Um, can I share screen? Oh, okay. Uh, actually, we have a long, a very long list of Professor Richard working experience here. Yeah? Here and very outstanding uh, working experience and research and also publication. But I would like to resume this uh, curriculum PT with this uh, short, uh, just short curriculum PT here. Okay, hopefully it's not reduce your long list of working experience and publication, publication yeah. Okay, uh, Professor Richard Milam. He's currently an associate professor at Durban University of Technology in Durban, South Africa, and a young professor of computer science at the University of Energy and Natural Resource in Ghana. And after 13 years of industrial experience, Professor Milham switched to academia and has worked at universities in Ghana, South Sudan, Scotland, and Bahamas. His research interests include, but not limited to software evolution, aspect of cloud computing with M interaction, big data, data streaming, fog and edge analytics, and aspects of the internet of things. And he's a chartered engineering at UK, a, a chartered engineering assessor and senior member of IEEE. Okay, uh, before we start the presentation, uh, I would like to ask uh, the participant to turn on the video so we can see your happy face. Yeah. Okay, uh, 
And without uh, further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Richard Milon to deliver the speech. All right, Professor, the time is yours. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for the uh, kind introduction. Thank you very much, Prof Yap and esteemed colleagues of SCDS uh, uh, for having me. My name is Richard Milan from the Durban University of Technology in Durban, South Africa. I'd like to talk to you about the use of bio-inspired algorithms for intelligent energy management of renewable energy resources. Renewable energy resources is um, particularly uh, important just now due to the uh, pressing problems of climate change. But in, uh, also in many countries, uh, renewable re uh, energy resources are seen as a more reliable source than fossil fuels. This is particularly the, the case in South Africa um, where I uh, suffered power cuts, uh, six power cuts within the last 48 hours. So, Um, just a, a, a brief uh, description of South Africa and uh, where Durban is. Uh, Durban is the th uh, third largest uh, city in Cape Town after Johannesburg uh, in the middle and uh, Joburg on th um, the Atlantic and is the largest uh, port in South Africa. Um, you can see uh, it outlined in the um, in the, the uh, red uh, dot, okay? It's located on the uh, warm Indian Ocean and is um, um, near the landlocked nations of uh, mountainous Lesotho and Swaziland, as well as the nearby uh, nations of uh, Mozambique Bots and Botswana. It has great surfing and water sports for those who are interested. So please do come visit. So what is the Durban University of Technology? It arose from humble beginnings at, uh, as technical schools at the beginning of the last century. It has uh, 30,000 uh, students at two main campuses, one in Durban and one in Peter Maritzburg, uh, which is about an hour's away uh, drive from Durban in the uh, Drachensburg Mountains. It has a faculty of engineering, health, uh, management, uh, applied sciences, and accounting and information technology. And a little bit of uh, propaganda for you. Um, the uh, Times World University Rankings uh, rates the Durban University of Technologies in uh, the top five of all South African universities. So climate change, as we can see by the graph, the uh, temperature of the earth has uh, increased dramatically uh, over the past 140 years, despite a decrease in solar irradiation, the amount of solar energy hitting the earth. In the past 151 years, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has changed from 280 to 417 parts per million, mostly from burning um, fossil fuels, okay? Uh, now, with the increase in sur surface temperature comes an uh, increased rate of water evaporation, which holds, uh, you know, um, heat leading to feedback le uh, loops, uh, which, of course, in increase the temperature further and more uh, frequent and destructive weather patterns, such as hurricanes, heat waves and droughts. And we have seen this recently in North America, the Caribbean and uh, Europe, among many other places. Now, um, another example of uh, these climate change, um, change feedback loops are disappearing glaciers at um, the poles um, in which uh, less sun sun sunlight is reflected back into space, uh, whereas more sunlight is absorbed in the ocean and warmer temperatures are spread throughout the world. So for example, um, we, we have a warmer climate, the um, Arctic uh, uh, um, polar ice melts and uh, it, it 
converts from, uh, if you will, the uh, white glaciers, which reflect most of the solar ir irradiation, back to uh, back into space into blue waters, which absorb it. Okay, so uh, it now forms part of the ocean, which absorbs more uh, uh, more solar energy, which increases the temperature, which again results in a um, higher global temperature. Um, another aspect of disappearing uh, glaciers uh, on land is um, where um, in uh, sub temperate uh, climates where um, you know snow would fall during the winter, okay, in the highlands and lowlands. Now, traditionally, of course, when spring comes, there'll be a runoff as snow um, melts in the lowlands, but um, the uh, glaciers, which serve as a water reservoir, will re would re remain in the mountains. Um, and uh, as spring turns into summer, would gradually melt and produce a steady, uh, um, if you will, water flow. What we're seeing now, of course, is because of higher temperatures, um, the snow in both the lowlands and the highlands are melting, resulting in quite destructive spring flooding. And of course, droughts in the summer. All right. Um, now, climate change uh, in, in terms of South Africa, the average rainfall per square kilometer in South Africa is less than Egypt. With decreasing rainfall, we are experiencing consistent regional droughts, okay? Uh, in the Western Cape, around Cape Town, um, it, it, uh, for, for several years, and um, after that, uh, uh, there was also a multi-year drought around Port Elizabeth to the uh, south, just to the southeast of Durban. So with these uh, multi-year um, droughts, we, um, we are suffering um, problems in terms of food production and availability of potable water. So obviously the conclusion is that burning of fossil fuels is no longer feasible. All right. Now, traditionally, most of South Africa's power came from coal-fired power plants. Now, due to regular contracts for vastly inflated work and uh, supplies over a decade, revenue from the state-owned power company is um, only able to pay interest owed on these contracts, rather than updating their power plants, many of them which are over 30 years old, or in investing in renewable energy. So consequently, private interests in renewable energy to replace state-owned uh, power supplies are becoming more predominant and more necessary. So um, in terms of renewable energy, uh, there, um, some people will, will say that there are three main drivers. One of course is the uh, failure of the state-owned power company to supply a, uh, reliable energy supply. Two is there are many um, isolated areas uh, that are basically energy deserts. You know, they, they need um, energy, but they're far uh, away uh, from the main power grid and lack the infrastructure to connect. Um, and the um, third reason is um, that uh, South Africa receives 600 um, more so solar hours than Germany, which is um, one of the world's leaders in renewable energy. Um, in, in addition, you know, Germany is, uh, has a high um, population, is, is quite densely uh, uh, compact, compact in, you know, in, in, or, uh, in, in terms of population. Uh, whereas in, in South Africa, we have wide expanses of, if you will, uh, desert like the Karoo, which would be ideally suited for so, uh, solar panel farms. So um, 
when uh, talking about renewable energy, one possible uh, solution to mitigate the effects of these climate change is the widespread adoption of renewable energy resources, okay, such as solar panel, geothermal, biomass, etc., to replace these traditional fuel-based sources in usage. Uh, this energy, like all other energy sources, has two sides. Consumption, where energy is utilized, either autonomously or based on user preferences, and production, where energy is produced and stored until it is consumed. Now, there is a need to balance supply and demand in order to prevent over and under loading. Although much effort has gone into renewable energy uh, engineering, there's also a need for intelligent energy management through software, which is what we are looking at just now. So an energy man management system will encompass many aspects. Okay, we'll have many sources of, of energy. It could be traditional nuclear, uh, coal, petroleum, natural gas, or it could be renewable, such as hydropower, wind, solar, geothermal, th thermal biomass. Okay, and uh, of course, we have different types of application, such as smart cities, smart bi uh, buildings, IoT, smart grids. Um, and of course, we have optimization objectives. We want to reduce CO2 em em uh, emissions, reduce the cost, maintain user preferences uh, in terms of, of load, okay? And manage load in production. So uh, we need to look at different types of algorithms to manage multiple objectives and aspects, all right? And um, here it lists, you know, different types. One is, you know, evolutionary uh, computations such as genetic algorithms, Others are swarm intelligence, such as ant colony, uh, particle swarm, um, artificial bee, etc. Now, smart homes uh, will consist of uh, enabled devices that communicate and collaborate with each other as agents in order to optimize energy and to prolong network uh, life. Now, these uh, devices often have energy, different energy requirements and consumption periods. Uh, an example, of course, uh, at least in South Africa, is a, is a heater. Uh, it, it, it consumes uh, much uh, energy, you know, uh, during the winter, but is, of course, uh, only uh, uh, needed, you know, during the winter and usually uh, needed, you know, um, during the evenings. So we're looking at a smart energy uh, framework, which is uh, abbreviated as HEMS. So it consists of two aspects. Um, appliances such as light, lighting or a PC, which are dependent on user preferences in the room and cannot be switched off. These are referred to as non-scheduled. Appliances such as a washing machine, which can be switched on or off as per a load shifting mechanism when the power exceeds a certain, certain threshold. Now, uh, often the regions will have peak consumption times with uh, peak energy consumption, which requires uh, excess production capacity to meet the demands during these specific times only. I do know in, in North America, the one of the peak consumption times is 5 to 7 p.m. People come home from work. They, uh, all right. The, uh, the, um, they uh, want to th throw a load in, 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 into the washer, you know, just to make sure uh, that it gets done. Well, you have to make supper. You know, the, the kids are watching TV or playing games. All right. So because of these uh, peaks, you have excess energy consumption sitting um, present throughout the day um, just to meet th this particular demand uh, in, in order uh, to prevent, if you will, some load shedding or outages. So um, in terms of a smart energy uh, network, why should we use bio-inspired algorithms? Well, um, from the diagram it itself, um, energy management itself is a multiple uh, objective problems. 
we we're, we're trying to re, uh, reduce uh, CO2 emissions. We're trying to um, manage, uh, uh, if you will, um, load and uh, production. Um, uh, and uh, we're, we're trying to reduce costs. So bio-inspired algorithms uh, have the ability to jump out of the local minimum, which might be the best solution for a particular objective such as reducing costs and search for the global minimum, the best solution for all the, all the objectives. Um, now, due to the distributed cooperative nature of swarm-based uh, bio-inspired algorithms, um, such as you know, particle swarm, um, artificial bee, these uh, algorithms are able to uh, process uh, data in heterogeneous environments, which are typically found in whole in a home, uh, obviously you're, you're going to have all kinds of appliances, lights, washing machines, stoves, etc. All right, apply randomization and efficient global and local searches to uh, achieve a, a new solution and form basic rules that can form some sort of intelligence by providing an optimization to adjust for varying energy needs. So uh, let, let's look at some uh, potential uh, algorithms that we might be using for a um, um, smart energy system for the homes. Genetic algorithm, while it has the advantage of few required parameters, uh, it has a disadvantage of slow convergence. Um, it's typically used in robotics, uh, scheduling, uh, and colony algorithms. It's robust and flexible as an advantage, but it also has slow convergence. It's often used for vehicle routing. Particle swarm, its uh, advantage is that it has effective global search parallelization, but it has a weak local search. It's often used in, in uh, ne uh, network um, systems. Um, Artificial uh, bee colony is robust. It's a highly flexible algorithm, which only needs two parameters to be set, but it does has, have the disadvantage of a weak local search uh, ability. Uh, it has, uh, it's typically used for uh, um, scheduling allocations. Uh, the glowworm swarm optimization is uh, capable for numeric optimization tasks but it suffers from low accuracy and slow convergence rates. It's often used for in routing and robotics. And the cuckoo search algorithm, uh, it has advantage of multi-objective multi functions with few parameters, but also suffers from slow convergence. It's often used in neural networks. So, uh, uh, one of the uh, algorithms that, that we uh, selected and we used uh, for our research was the artificial bee colony, which is based on the collective intelligence of foraging behavior of bees. Uh, now, here are the steps. They're quite, they're a, a bit simplified. All right. First, we initialize all food sources, which basically means, you know, all feasible solutions uh, are initialized. Uh, scout B, which is one type, will search all the, the, uh, for solutions uh, from the search space from all the sources. If found, it notifies all the other Bs. The employee B, the second type, exploits the food sources found by the scout B. The onlooker B, the third, third type, updates the found food source with a solution based on the probability value of the, the, the food source. So, if a food source is not updated in a long time, it is abandoned and the bee looks for a new food source. And this behavior is iterated until an automated, optimal solution is found. So basically the, the idea is to, uh, um, to keep searching for food sources, um, try to find the best one. As it gets de depleted, look, look for, for new ones, okay? and uh, uh, so forth uh, uh, until you reach, uh, you know, some sort of optimal solution or, you know, an optimal food source. 
Uh, now, uh, if we look at uh, 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 appliances in a home, all right, uh, using a, uh, an A, B, C. All right, so here, uh, algorithm, we have connected algorithms that sends a request message to all appliances that are operating to obtain uh, information on their energy and time requirements. If there is no uh, uh, reply message, the uh, artificial B colony is executed to determine the best time uh, um, of the uh, operation of the appliance, the start and end times, okay? Uh, if replies are received, the onlooker B phase is used to select the source based on the probability of the food energy source. Now, the reply message is processed if the request satisfies two conditions. The end time of the appliance sending the request has to be smaller than uh, the appliance receiving it, and the total power consumption of appliances at time slot T does not exceed the, um, th the threshold. So we look at uh, typical appliances in a home. A fridge and freezer um, is non-scheduled. It always has to be on. A lightning is non-scheduled because it depends on the consumer. Um, coffee maker, washing machine, dishwasher are all scheduled. And um, as, as per our algorithm, they do have different starting and end times. So if you look at the washing machine, Okay, uh, the operation time is 60 minutes. Okay, but if you look at the start and end time, it's an hour and a half. Um, that, that is to give a, a, a little bit of, um, if you will, extra time to switch, uh, you know, a washing machine off, uh, you know, during peak times and then restart it uh, in uh, during off peak times. And uh, you know, uh, it, when, when you're working with, say, a washing machine, as long as, as, long as it goes through a full cycle, your clothes are, are clean, all right? It does not have to run continuously or continuously through the, uh, its allocated uh, time operation. So here we, we are looking at uh, load balancing, okay? So this uh, basically shows the energy demands versus attempts to balance the load. So if we look um, at um, the allocated load capacity, it's, it's even, it's, it's stepped. Whereas the energy demand uh, is, uh, does fluctuate with time and often exceeds the allocated load capacity. So that, that all obviously uh, presents a problem. So our goal is to reduce the usage uh, during peak hours by shifting load, shifting the load from peak to off peak hours. And you can see uh, this happening where it reduces the uh, peak uh, usage that exceeds the allocated lo load capacity and shifts it to a later time uh, where, where there is, um, uh, there is uh, um, capacity uh, um, to, to manage that. All right, so um, new bio-inspired algorithms for smart energy management production side. All right, uh, spider prey algorithm. Uh, it imitates the behavior of spiders traversing their web, finding the best, uh, best and uh, best prey trapped in their, their web. Unlike the, the social spider algorithm, not all spiders respond. Only those spiders respond to trap prey, which enables some sort of parallelization of this algorithm. Now the trap uh, uh, prey sends an amplitude sig signal down the web as they try to escape uh, in terms of the degree of amplitude which indicates the freshness of the prey as they uh, gradually um, decrease from exhaustion. So um, this is a um, typical um, um, spider prey algorithm. 
Now, how can we apply it to a smart energy system in terms of production? Well, the prey will represent an energy source where the uh, degree of a prey's amplitude in indicates um, it as a renewable energy um, resource. Uh, nearby spiders communicating uh, via their frequencies converge on the best uh, suited um, energy source to ensure its incorporation into their energy production. So uh, a spider web represents a, a web for communication among spider. The uh, prey within the web represents an energy solution and the web it is an analogy to the constraints of a power grid. Um, now this uh, algorithm tries to search through the discovery space to locate the highest peak and then locate the next highest peak, which represents the best and, and, and uh, next best strongest source of energy. Uh, every peak represents a group of related energy sources. So it could be solar, it could be uh, biomass, uh, it could be wind, okay? Or, um, now the spider uh, uh, performs a techno ec um, economic analysis of the grid, uh, which can be existing or newly created, meaning that uh, it, it's able to use an existing power grid or it, it's able to develop its own, own grid. Um, now this, this analysis, analysis will uh, result in the optimization of um, uh, um, uh, renew, uh, uh, re renewable energy data in terms of its uh, production sizing, economic and uh, uh, technical uh, data costs. Okay, so uh, communication and convergence of spiders. Now, free, uh, spiders communicate among themselves using frequencies that uh, travel along the web. A graph shows a gradual convergence of spiders towards their, their uh, prey. Experimental trials of the spider prey algorithm in uh, mu um, multiple trials showed that the search agents were uh, better able to find a, 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 a solution as the, the uh, convergence curve monotonically decreases with, uh, with respect to iteration time in a highly dim dimensional search, search space. Now in this uh, simulation, the user has to define the number of agents, uh, the number of iterations, search space, et cetera. Um, as, uh, um, uh, as future work, we hope to, to have this be, uh, done uh, autonomously. Um, Consequently, the spider prey algorithm has the potential of improving the accuracy for capturing renewable energy sources, given that spiders uh, and um, predators uh, communicate uh, across, across the web uh, in order to, uh, to meet, to find the potential uh, 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 optimal uh, location. Uh, what, sorry, once, once again, uh, the uh, spider prey algorithm has the potential of uh, improving accuracy for capturing po uh, power sources given that spiders and prey can communicate uh, across the web to mutually uh, find the potential optim optimal uh, location. Uh, here's a further example of convergence. We, uh, in this graph, we see multiple spiders on the web each denoted by different colors at various positions. Now, given their uh, internal communications um, uh, re regarding a potential prey, these spiders gradually start to converge until they reach the, the prey's location where they can exploit it. Um, now, with a, a social spider prey algorithm, the renewable production resources are, are defined as solar, wind, and biomass, with battery backup, uh, you know, during week production times, such as no winter or sun, uh, such as the evening, and diesel generation as a backup during peak load times. Now we uh, use various scenarios based on yearly weather data, um, in in, uh, in 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 terms of 
absence of presence of uh, particular renewable energy uh, resources and uh, there are subsequent effects on the requirement for fossil fuel based backup power generation. Uh, in addition, we did optimal uh, sizing of renewable energy production units and costing via the algorithm. So here it is some uh, yearly solar ir irradiation uh, data. Now, in order to understand the renewable energy patterns, it's important to understand yearly patterns of renewable energy res resources. So as we can see from this uh, historical data, um, the uh, solar irradiation will uh, vary obviously by hour, by day, and by season. And one of the uh, disadvantages of using this historical data is that uh, it was all pulled from Johannesburg. And Johannesburg is in the middle of the continent with a continental client, climate. And because it's such a large um, city, um, it might be a, um, uh, uh, what, 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 what they call a, um, uh, um, if, if, if you will, uh, a solar island, which uh, artif uh, artificially, if you will, in inflates the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the temperatures um, with, within it, uh, similarly to New York. So um, again, we also look at wind speed. Okay, which also varies by hours, by seasons, and we can see some uh, dramatic peaks during storms. Once again, this is a uh, continental climate, and uh, this poses a, a problem uh, in South Africa, uh, along with many other countries, because uh, there are many different uh, types of climates within South Africa. So uh, where it's very sunny, in one place, it, it might be very cloudy, or where it's, it might be extremely windy in one place, it, it, um, it, it might not in another. And low demand throughout the year, okay? And this, uh, once again, varies tremendously depending on the hour, evening, uh, the, the, the day, and the season. And once again, we're looking at a continental climate. Um, in this uh, particular instance, of course, uh, um, during the summer, there's going to be a large energy demand for air conditioning. During the winter, there's going to be a large uh, energy demand for heating. So the um, uh, low demand is a little bit skewed versus say uh, Durban where, um, um, the um, uh, the uh, summers are, you know, much uh, much more milder as are the, the winters. So here we're looking at scenario one, which is solar, wind, and no biomass. So as seen in the graph, solar and wind vary depending on weather condition. The biomass production is non-existent. Consequently, there's a high dependency on battery and diesel generation to make up this shortfall. The algorithmic performance is fairly consistent across iterations, as we can see, all right? And the biomass is at zero. Uh, I, I know the, the slide is a little bit hard uh, to see. Uh, we're, we're looking at another uh, scenario where the solar, wind, and biomass are present. So with the availability of all three renewable energy resources, which uh, recharge the battery during peak production times, the use of diesel generation is greatly reduced. Um, so as, as we can see, the biomass uh, production has risen uh, to a uh, um, uh, steady rate, you know, it's risen from zero to a particular steady rate. Now, uh, of course, biomass will uh, vary in its production depending on, on the type of uh, uh, fuel that is being used, uh, you know, its equipment, et cetera. So, we, um, so assumptions ha had to be made in terms of that. But the algorithm is uh, once again, fairly consistent in managing 
um, these uh, varying different types of uh, production uh, sources. So here we're looking at optimal size sizes of production units. So given uh, all these various uh, scenarios, um, we can do an optimal sizing of production units to meet the low demand uh, using uh, standard calculations. Now, um, these standard calculations, of course, uh, are based on cer certain specifications of panels, turbines, etc. So, um, given these, uh, given the um, these uh, types of um, production, the units. Are, um, are the following. Solar, 17 panels, wind, 12 turbines, biomass, 12 generations, uh, generators, sorry, uh, batteries, 17, diesel, 42 standalone generators. Costing and reliability of production, loss of power uh, supply probability, 4.2455. So for a given period, what is the estimated uh, days in the year that your model would not be able to meet the load? Okay, uh, in, in many countries, uh, four days would, would be a, a, a bit of an outrage. In, in South Africa, people would be celebrating in the streets. Reliability, 7.2445%. Again, for a given period, what is the percentage that the system would not be able to meet the, the uh, load considering uh, unit failure? Um, the net present value, 5,839 US dollars. Total emission, 0 0.0978, uh, which is the, C the carbon dioxide emissions among other gas emissions. Uh, and the emission uh, penalty cost, 14.668, which is a, a global standard charge for emitting carbon uh, as per international agreements. So uh, in conclusion, when we look at the effects of climate change, which are brought largely upon us by the burning of uh, fossil fuels, um, we, uh, we've looked at uh, you know, some of the issues uh, and some of the uh, uh, continu con continuing problems in terms of uh, feedback loops and um, uh, threats, if you will, to our food security. Now, a mitigating solution to energy needs has been proposed in terms of renewable energy, which varies in types, but uh, forms can be found in any country. Bio-inspired algorithms based on swarm intelligence can be utilized to find a potential solution to a multiple objective problem, which is smart energy management of renewable resources from both the load and production size. Uh, from the load side, smart entities consisting of IoT-connected uh, consumption devices act as agents to control their operations and to communicate with each other. Bio-inspired algorithms can be used to schedule uh, appliance operations such that it shifts the operation from peak to off-peak hours. On the production side, the uh, social uh, spider prey algorithm has been used to identify and utilize uh, nearby renewable energy resources, along with balancing various sources to achieve a uh, reliable, steady supply. From historical uh, weather data, various scenarios of different sources being present uh, would, uh, have been given with their subsequent cons consequences on reliance of other sources, such as fossil fuels. Uh, we had uh, various parameters of production, such as the production unit sizing and cost uh, being calculated. So in terms of future work, immediate future work, uh, we are uh, looking at using real-time data from sensor networks rather than historical data in order to show the algorithm robustness in a real-time data st uh, streaming environment. Um, this has the advantage in that it might result in greater buy-in from skeptical consumers, particularly in South Africa. And um, also um, uh, might address the, the, the problems of multiple climbs uh, within South Africa or different countries. Um, although different algorithms were used for the production and consumption side, 
with some coordination, there is a need uh, to develop, uh, develop better global coordination and collaboration for the smart energy system. There's a need to scale this system onto larger entities such as a smart building or a city. And scalability is a big issue when you're managing a huge number of heterogeneous entities within a smart framework. And uh, once again, there, um, there's a need for a more autonomy, which is automatic by the environment rather than the user. Um, here are some references. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you, Professor Richard. Actually, uh, for me, this algorithm, especially spider prey, is uh, new, new for me. So thank you uh, for sh sharing this algorithm to us. I open a question and answer session. I invite the participant or committee if you have a question. Yeah, uh, not yet. Maybe I'll ask one question. Is it sure. possible? Okay. Um, uh, spider prey algorithm. Uh, is it uh, similar with genetic algorithm, ECO, or another methodology? And if uh, this methodology is similar with this approach, actually, we hope that the algorithm can reach global optimum. And how this algorithm, what I mean is spider prey algorithm, can ensure us to reach the global optimum and not stuck in local optimum. Thank you, Professor. Okay, okay, all right. Well, the spider prey algorithm uh, is newly developed. Um, so th that is why you know uh, many of the aspects of it are you know still works in in progress, and which is probably why you never heard of it. Um, it it's, it's it's not really a genetic algorithm. Uh, one would would say it's it's more of a, a swarm based in intelligence al algorithm. Uh, it, it's maybe closest relative is a social a spider uh, social. Um, uh, a uh, 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 social spider algorithm, okay, but it, it does have um, you know some uh, unique characteristics in in terms of you know parallelization, uh, in in terms of uh, um, focusing on on prey, etc. Um, now the the other question was uh, in terms of local versus global optima, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, yeah. Well, um, one one of the um, advantages many people would would argue of using a bio-inspired algorithm that rather than say a, a classical algorithm is the sort of the levy walk where uh, where you you you, you uh, basically uh, search the solution space for a particular solution, but you have the ability to jump out of a uh, particular found solution uh, to search for another. And this, this is repeated un until you find the, the, the best um, uh, possible solution. Uh, one of the, the uh, problems with many uh, classical um, methods such as SVM is that it will find a, uh, uh, global uh, optima and and uh, be, be stuck there. Uh, whereas um, with a bio-inspired algorithm, there um, because of the levy walk, uh, it's it's able to sort of jump out of that and and look for look at all other possible solutions. Uh, uh, um, one uh, disadvantage of of this, of course, is that of course it will require further um, amounts of time. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor, for the answer. And for the other participant, is there any question? One maybe, or we can close okay. this session. Do you have any question? Okay. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, please. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Prof. Uh, Good yeah. to see you. Okay. Hi, Prof. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Prof. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, two quick questions. No one is there are so many optimization algorithms out there. Uh, can you advise um, which is the uh, more efficient algorithm that practitioners can use? Number two is can you comment on the Grey Wolf uh, optimizer? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. For the first question, uh, you you ask which is the best optimization? Yeah, there's so many. It's more than twenty, and there's so many. So sometimes uh, students don't know which one to choose. <laughs> yeah, th th there's actually more than two hundred bio-inspired yeah. algorithms. And, the popular um, ones. Huh? Sorry. The popular ones. More the more popular ones. Okay. Well. <laughs> um, um, I guess the most popular ones are, uh, if you will, uh, particle swarm and colony, um, uh, well optimization, etc. But that does not necessarily mean that they're the, the most optimal. What, uh, um, what, one of the reasons why that they're, they're often used is that they're in the public domain. Many of these algorithms have been developed in academia and are kept closely because it just requires a huge amount of time and effort to produce. So um, they, they will, if you will, melt these algorithms or as, 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 as uh, much as possible before releasing them into the public. So um, in, in terms of algorithms, it all depends on what you want to do um, and you know what are your constraints in terms of the best optimization? In terms of the gray uh, gray, uh, gray wolf algorithm, okay. Um, now there's different variants there thereof. Uh, it also is sort of a swarm intelligence where the, you know they communicate with each other using sense, and they both converge on on a, 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 a prey. Um, um, are, are, are you asking is is a spider prey algorithm uh, better or worse than the the wolf algorithm? Or, um, I, I guess it, it all it it, it all depends yeah. on the the environment. Yes, uh, and also to be honest, the we uh, the spider prey algorithm is just we're just. Uh, kind of at a certain phase of development uh, where there has not, you know, we, uh, we've tested it against uh, different mathematical functions, et cetera, but we have not thoroughly tested it against, uh, you know, comparative bio-inspired algorithms, you know, in terms of efficiency, et cetera. Great, thank you, very interesting. Thank you so much. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, thank you for the question and thank you for the answer. And unfortunately, we have reached the end of the session. So I would like to thank to you all, especially for the for Professor Richard for his excellent talk talks. And hopefully, it will give much insight for us to conduct a future research. And I would I would like also. I would also like to apologize for any inconvenience during the session. And once again, thank you all. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good afternoon. Okay. Maybe Professor Richard uh, have a closing uh, remark before we close the session. Uh, no, thank okay. you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very it's much. Okay. I'll give it back to the Master of Ceremony. Okay, thank you to Professor Dr. Richard Milham and Dr. Irhama for the keynote speech. That was such an interesting topic that you share with us. And we sincerely appreciate your time and would love to give a certificate of appreciation for Professor wow. Dr. Richard Milham. Professor, uh, may you stop your screen, please? I want to share your certificate. Thank you very much. Very Thank much you, appreciated.
I'm sorry, Professor Richard, can you stop sharing screen? Oh, my bad, sorry. Yeah, in the top side, this top screen. I, I do apologize. I, I'm more used to Teams. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Yes. Sorry. I, yeah. Okay, we will take a photo with Professor Milha. Okay, I will count to three and please do the comedy to take the photo. One, two, three. Okay, please everyone give a great round of applause for Professor Milham. Maybe some reaction. Okay, thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our next keynote speaker, Associate Professor Dr. Aidan Daharty from Oxford University, UK. And the keynote speech will be moderated by Professor Dr. Yap Biwa from University Technology Mara. Please, Associate Professor Dr. Aidan Doherty and Professor Dr. Yap Biwa, you may take the time. Thank you, Ms. Mora. Hi. Hello, Professor Aidan. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. And um, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Great. Just give me, uh, just let me introduce you first, yeah? No problem. Yeah, it's good to see you online. <laughs> we finally meet yes. online. <laughs> okay. Uh, a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, it's indeed a great privilege. Okay, for me and for all of us to meet Professor, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Aidan Dahati from Oxford University. Okay, Associate Professor Dr. Aidan Dahati obtained his Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from University of Ulster, UK, and PhD in Computer Science from Dublin City University, University Island. He currently leads the Biomedical Data Science Research Group in. You see of Oxford's Big Data Institute. His group develops reproducible machine learning methods to analyze variable sensor data in very large heart studies to better understand the causes and consequences of disease. He has given more than 40 invited talks in 12 countries, and he has more than 70 peer-reviewed publications. Professor Aiden has received numerous awards, which include Marie Sklodowska Curie Action Co. Fund Award and Oxford Rubin College AI and Machine Learning Fellowship. The title for Associate Professor Dr. Aiden's talk is Reproducible Machine Learning of Human Behaviors in Terabytes of Wearables Data. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Dr. Aiden Dahati. Over to you. Many thanks for the very kind introduction uh, <laughs> and the uh, opportunity uh, to share some of my work with you and uh, and uh, all the attendees of this talk. Um, so I'm, uh, I said, I'm based at uh, Oxford's Big Data Institute, and uh, this is, uh, at least in the UK, a very unique uh, enterprise. Uh, whereby we're a research institute of about 400 uh, people and we have lots of people from clinical medicine, uh, population health and epidemiology, but put in the same building as uh, individuals from statistics, computer science, engineering, uh, etc. And our goal as an institute is to work on some of the large uh, healthcare challenges that exist today uh, that was a very much a multidisciplinary uh, lens and view on that. And within the Big Data Institute, um, I lead a group then that is very much focused on the uh, analysis uh, of wearable data sets. And I'll explain in a little bit uh, why A, I believe wearables is very important, uh, and B, particularly what its applications are uh, within healthcare, and particularly population health and epidemiology. So, uh, and, and here's a picture of some of the um, uh, brilliant researchers in my own group. And we are uh, currently hiring more researchers, particularly around genomic discovery and machine learning hosts. Um, so, uh, and I, I will I come back to that towards the end. And within our institute, oh, and, and more widely within health data science, there's a, a huge interest in machine learning. 
um, and as with many other fields as well. And I guess why within healthcare are we interested in machine learning and what is the potential for us to uh, transform uh, medicine? So uh, as indicated in the top of the slide here, uh, it's really been driven by two key things. Uh, first of all, uh, much more access to much greater volumes of data. And this is driven by advances in digital measurement technologies, such as electronic healthcare records, uh, internet of things, wearables, genomics. Um, and uh, additionally, uh, it's driven by having very large scale biobank uh, studies now. So these are generally studies with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of individuals who have genetic information assayed, uh, who are followed up um, to, with uh, electronic healthcare records to see who goes on to develop disease, what types of disease, when, uh, etc. And these biobanks generate huge volumes of information. So there's been a, a, a transformation in the amount of information we generate within medicine. And then secondly, uh, there's been uh, amazing advances, particularly over the last 15 years, and uh, as many of you will be aware, uh, around uh, just increases in raw compute power via uh, GPUs and the uh, fantastic advances that have happened uh, within that. So we've had these drives in, in data and in uh, and in compute power, and that's really made uh, 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 created a lot of interest in the possible use of machine learning for for clinical medicine. And for, from my own point of view, uh, there probably hasn't been quite as much advancement in, in the methods um, uh, because I would argue that. Uh, if I was able to time travel back to the 1980s and take a machine learning researcher from them uh, and transport them forward to the year 2021, they could read, I would argue, quite and follow and understand uh, a, a paper from today that might be published in Nature Medicine or, or an equivalent journal. Um, they could follow all the methods. Uh, so a lot of our uh, advances are being driven by uh, again, more data and uh, much larger compute capacity. And there are three areas in particular uh, that machine learning uh, can positively, or at least has the potential to positively contribute to. They include diagnosis, risk prediction, and decision support. And it's particularly adept for areas where we've got what I call cryptic or hard to find features. So think of imaging, think of free text, unstructured electronic healthcare records, and also uh, areas or data coming from uh, wearable devices that has high frequency uh, time series data. So with these types of data, it's, as I said in the slide here, very hard to define some good handcrafted features from those. So these are the uh, particular modalities in which machine learning can substantially contribute to either diagnosis, does a person have diabetic retinopathy or not from an eye scan, for risk prediction, looking at one's clinical characteristics, will they go on to develop acute kidney injury, or also for decision support. And most of the rest of my talk will be uh, unashamedly focused on wearable sensors in health, and uh, why wearables, and, and apologies for giving a UK specific example, uh, but in the UK, which has got a population of about 60 million people, uh, around 8 million uh, uh, people uh, in the UK then are active day-to-day -day users of consumer wearables, such as Fitbits or Apple Watches. And these devices are very exciting because they collect information on a wide range of physiological traits, including physical activity, uh, heart rate and rhythms, sleep patterns, and really they do represent a huge wealth of largely unexploited information. But uh, it's very easy to get excited by technology, uh, it's, but it's always important uh, that we have a clinical need or uh, clear uh, 
uh, medical problem that we are trying to address and to use the technology to solve an existing problem uh, rather than push the technology to solve um, a, a problem that is not really a clinical problem. And physical activity and heart disease is an incredibly uh, important area within uh, population health. And, uh, and one might think, well, it's pretty well known that if I be more active, that this can uh, lower my risk of heart disease. But there are a number of unanswered questions, such as uh, how active uh, should I be? And are there perhaps um, consequences to being not so active? So here in this slide, I'm showing you uh, an example of, of a study in over a million women uh, in the UK who were asked to self-report uh, on the x-axis the amount of physical activity they did. And then the y-axis, we followed them up for 15, 20 years uh, to see who went on to develop heart disease, um, or specifically coronary heart disease. So the y-axis shows the associated event rate. And what we can see over in the very right-hand side for x-axis is that it appears there are some uh, adverse or detrimental effects to individuals who reported doing more frequent exercise. And there's genuine uncertainty over whether this is a real phenomenon or whether uh, it's an a, a artifact of asking people what they do rather than directly measuring it. So we know self-report can be crude and unreliable and prone to many different forms of bias. So we would really like to answer questions, uh, we'd really like to redefine and, and see, is it really detrimental for one to engage in higher levels of physical activity? And so I, I will frame the rest of the talk then around these three key questions. First of all, how strongly is wearable measure of physical activity associated with uh, incident cardiovascular disease, i.e. Uh, people who are uh, currently healthy but go on to develop disease. And then what types of activity are associated with lower cardiovascular disease incidence? And finally, uh, are wearable measurements trustworthy, i.e. can we trust machine learning methods when they're used uh, in the medical domain? So to answer the first question of how strongly is uh, a wearable measurement of activity that associate with future cardiovascular disease, uh, we ideally need a very large scale study uh, with longitudinal follow up. In the UK, we are very fortunate to have a, a major biomedical resource called the UK Biobank. And uh, while it is a, a biobank of people in the UK, it is a resource that is available to all researchers worldwide. So I and Oxford do not have any additional privileged access to this data set than someone in uh, Kuala Lumpur would have, or in Singapore, uh, or in Los Angeles. So it's a truly international resource uh, that you can go to the website of, um, you can apply for access to this data for a, for a minimal cost of about a thousand uh, pounds, uh, what's that, probably around $1,200 thereabouts. So, uh, and, and this is a study of uh, 500,000 individuals. Uh, we've got genetic information on all these individuals They've been asked a series of questions on their family history, on their self-reported health status. They've had their heart, uh, heart scanned uh, uh, and, and additionally, a significant subset have had brain scanned, liver scanned. Uh, so there's a range uh, of clinical measurements on these individuals. And part of interest and to this talk is that we give people a Fitbit type device, uh, a wrist or a accelerometer to wear for seven days. Uh, and we've measured this on 100,000 uh, of the participants. And, uh, and here's a picture of the device up in the top left uh, corner. So it's just a very simple wrist device. 
uh, that records acceleration in the X, uh, forwards and backwards, Y, side to side, and Z, up and down directions, and does so at a rate of 100 hertz, uh, meaning that we have about 180 million data readings per participant per week, uh, then times 100,000 participants. So we're dealing with uh, many terabytes of data, uh, about 100 terabytes uncompressed, uh, although once one compresses it, it's down to about 10 to 15 terabytes um, of size, so big but manageable. And if a, a clear problem is, well, A, handling that amount of data, but the much bigger problem is uh, carefully processing that data to make sure we get some clinically meaningful measurements of physical activity from these risk board devices. So we have to go through a number of steps, such as uh, calibrating the devices to ensure that two different devices uh, give the same output uh, under the same conditions. Uh, we combine the X, Y, and Z axes together under a, a, a vector magnitude um, to get a single uh, uh, vector uh, of movement for any instance in time. One must filter out the effects of noise, uh, machine-related vibrations, for example, and gravity. Uh, and then when you ask 100,000 people to wear a device, not everyone will, um, and, and certainly not everyone will do so all the time. So we need to identify periods of non-wear and eventually adjust our analysis for that, uh, because we can't just take a crude average across the data uh, because I could cheat and not wear the device at night time. So then it gets the average of just my daytime activity that will be unfairly inflated. So we just appropriately account for that in our analysis. And very important then for us is that uh, these uh, data processing pipelines are validated in smaller uh, clinical validation studies against known standards, uh, such as doubly labeled water, which is the gold standard measurement of physical activity, energy expenditure. And then as will be familiar to many of you in the audience when dealing with sensor data, then uh, we can uh, uh, do all forms of detailed time series analysis, uh, such as down the bottom right of the screen, we've got a, uh, a, a just simple descriptive uh, of the X axis being hour of day and the Y axis being mean acceleration, which is an excellent proxy for how physically active individuals are. And we can see uh, not big differences between men and women, but very clear differences by age, whereby older participants are uh, markedly less active than younger participants, which is expected. Uh, the slightly unknown thing to us is that the differences are more apparent um, in the afternoons and early evenings. But this is just descriptive information and, uh, and, and essentially just correlational analysis. So there's no inference of causality in this. And the, the key thing for involving wearables uh, or any sensors in large epidemiological studies is that we need longitudinal follow-up to see can we predict future events? That's much more interesting. So now it's been about seven years since these individuals wore the devices. So we can begin to start to look at uh, whether the device can predict uh, future health outcomes. So the first example I'd like to show you is a, a, a paper published by my colleagues in Cambridge uh, just last year uh, that is investigated the association between physical uh, accelerometer measure of physical activity, energy expenditure on the x-axis, and the y-axis then is its association with all-cause mortality. So uh, what we can see then is that the uh, hazard ratio um, uh, is uh, clearly much lower for those who are more active. Uh, and also we can see that there's a very apparent, uh, at least log linear response. We're not finding any evidence uh, to the, uh, the higher levels of activity that there is any detrimental effect in terms of being more active. So we're getting already very clear signals and this is with three years of follow-up. Um, at Oxford then we uh, followed up with a complementary paper uh, 
just earlier this year than that uh, has used uh, a greater amount of information with five years of follow-up uh, and investigating the association between physical activity and future uh, or incident cardiovascular disease. Uh, 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 so this was of the 100,000 individuals of that five-year time period, three and a half thousand people had uh, incident events, i.e. heart attacks or strokes. And there are two main messages uh, from this uh, particular graph. The first is that, uh, again, there is a, almost a linear, uh, what we call a dose response association, uh, meaning that for those who are engaging in the highest levels of activity, there is no evidence uh, for an increase in their associated cardiovascular risk. And secondly, what was very striking to us was the magnitude of the association, i.e. the 40% reduction. So in the past, we had typically assumed that those who are most active would have about a 20 to 25% reduction. But with this study now using much more precise forms of measurement, we are finding that there's about a 40% reduction in ones uh, at risk of developing cardiovascular disease if being more active. So this has, got a lot, this has got huge implications then for our uh, national healthcare strategies around prevention of cardiovascular disease, i.e. physical activity is more important than we previously thought. But additionally, we would like to ask a key question of what types of physical activity are associated with lower cardiovascular disease incidence? Because I'm sure many of you are thinking, well, you're dealing with very rich time series data, why just reduce it down uh, to a, essentially a glorified average of the data, even if it is a very good proxy for physical activity um, levels in individuals. So the intuition here then is that if I'm sitting or walking or driving, uh, there will be very different movements uh, and uh, signatures and the associated acceleration trace. Uh, with each of those activities. So it's a very classical human activity recognition challenge. And there have been many efforts in this space in the past, but unfortunately, none of the models developed have been appropriate to deploy in epidemiological studies. And the key reason for that is that the uh, value is that the development of models and the evaluation of machine learning models for this exercise has always taken place in laboratory environments. So these are uh, very artificial environments whereby individuals are asked to go through an, uh, an unrealistic sequence of activities in an unrealistic environment and therefore will develop a uh, uh, unrealistic and uh, arguably useless uh, models. So we really need free living validation data sets. So this is where uh, wearable cameras can be incredibly helpful. So uh, essentially these are devices that one wear, wears via neck or a lanyard and they take first person point of view uh, images. And to give you a flavor of the data from a wearable camera, and uh, here we can see a, a, an image then of uh, one of our uh, rollers um, at, uh, at Oxford University uh, who, who were at a training event. And so this is taken first person point of view images. From the images, it's um, very obvious what type of activity an, an individual is engaged in. Are they sitting? Are they walking? Are they running? Or, or in this case, are they rowing? So this allows us to set up a, a clinical validation data set in free living environments, uh, whereby individuals wear the camera, so we, we get a ground truth set of labels, and also then they wear an accelerometer uh, on the wrist, the same as is used in our biobank studies. So this uh, enables us then to train machine learning methods on the accelerometer uh, that uh, and to that are informed by labels in the camera and also of course we can then test the uh, performance of the accelerometer based machine learning methods um, in, uh, uh, in test sets of uh, camera uh, data as well and to share with you the types of models that we have developed uh, this slide's a little bit upside down it's going to start from the bottom and work its way up so we've got raw input sensor data 
we extract just very classic time and frequency domain features uh, from uh, the accelerate from the acceleration trace. We use a window size of thirty seconds. Uh, we uh, and then using that uh, thirty second uh, set of features and associated label them from the uh, camera data. We uh, put that into a random forest uh, classifier to make a preliminary prediction on the type of activity that an individual was engaged in. Of course, that being sensor data, it's beautiful time series data, so we want to perform time smoothing over that, um, uh, uh, over the predictions from the random forest. And so then we uh, use a hidden Markov model. Uh, the intuition being for each 30 second window, the prediction is sleeping, sleeping, bike riding, sleeping, sleeping. It's unlikely a person went for a 30 second bike ride in the middle of the night. Uh, so hence then the hidden mark of model can smooth over that and correct uh, the erroneous prediction. And of course, a key question then is how well does it work? So, uh, using a free living uh, validation data set of about 150 individuals, uh, this is about two and a half thousand hours of annotated behavior. To put this in context, the largest existing free living, uh, or sorry, the largest existing human activity recognition data sets have got probably less than 100 hours of annotated human movement behaviors in constrained laboratory environments. So this data set is much, much larger than uh, any other existing human activity recognition data set. And with the key aspect being that it's in free living environments, so it's got most ecological validity. Uh, from the camera, there are of course many different behavior types can be identified, but we've collapsed on uh, into these four major categories that we're particularly interested in being able to classify well from the accelerometer, namely sleep, Sedentary behavior, light activity, and moderate to vigorous activity. Uh, so then, with the uh, the random forest and hidden Markov uh, model classifier, we've been able then to achieve uh, this accuracy of eighty eight percent. I personally don't like accuracy as an evaluation metric, and much prefer the Kappa interrater reliability scores. It takes. Uh, random agreement uh, into consideration. So we've got a Kappa score of about 0.8, uh, which is traditionally considered on the borderline of substantial to almost perfect levels of agreement. Now it's clearly still got quite a way to go to the perfect level of agreement, but we can live with uncertainty and measurement error because now we've captured what the level of uncertainty is. And after a very careful uh, checks and sanity checks in our biobank data set to ensure that the distribution of behaviors is expected, uh, that they are uh, correlated in expected directions with age and disease status. Uh, we can then uh, construct, uh, uh, we can then use this uh, deployed model for, uh, for epidemiological inference. And so here's a first example I've shown uh, whereby we can construct what 24 hours uh, of human movement behaviours looks like, in this case, in 91,000 uh, UK biobank participants uh, deploying our model. Uh, again, x-axis are of day, y-axis is probability of being in a particular event type. Uh, so reassuringly, at 4 a.m., most of the population uh, are asleep. And this opens up all forms of healthcare analysis. One of the early analysis uh, that we did was to uh, perform a, a what we call a genome-wide association study, and we to investigate what genetic variants are associated with these machine-learned human movement behaviors. So we discovered new genetic variants uh, associated with sleep and sedentary behavior and overall physical activity, and. Additionally, then, what we're uh, really interested in is can this uh, machine learning behaviors help predict who goes on to develop heart disease? So we have recently published a paper then that is, uh, again, looking at uh, the association of these variables with incident, i.e. future cardiovascular disease. 
uh, and for this particular analysis, then over 4,000 heart attack and stroke events uh, had uh, happened in these uh, 87,000 participants. And to orientate you here to the top left hand side, sorry, first of all, I should say what we've used is a compositional data analysis model, because we can't use a typical uh, logistic regression model or Cox regression model. Um, because uh, such models assume, well, if I do a little bit extra uh, moderate activity, I assume that I am doing no other, or I assume that I hold all the other activities constant, but then that breaks the violation of a 24-hour day. We can't magically create new time. So instead we use uh, a method called compositional data analysis that um, uh, then if I do more moderate activity, I must take time out of the other uh, activities um, in a proportional sense. So we account for that using compositional data analysis. Then to orientate you towards our findings on the top left graph, we're looking then at the trade-off between sleep and sedentary behavior while holding the other activities constant. So then, uh, and then the y-axis then is what we call the estimated hazard ratio. Think of it as that the associated risk for cardiovascular disease above the line is higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Below the line is a lower risk of future cardiovascular disease. So the intuition here is that, uh, uh, that the more sedentary behavior I do at the expense of sleep, it increases my risk of developing heart disease. And then similarly, we can see the trade-off between the other activity behaviors. And the main message is that it is really done in the bottom row of three figures, showing that uh, moving from any type of behavior to doing a, just even a little bit of more moderate activity behavior is associated with a quite dramatic reductions in the risk of developing heart disease. And a very important thing for us then is that the tools we develop are made uh, freely available uh, via open source uh, GitHub repositories. And additionally, then the data we create uh, is made available then in the UK Biobank resource. So if you went off to uh, apply for access to the UK Biobank resource, you can use summary variables and quite easily get access to the summary variables. Um, that, that, for example, our group has created. Uh, and this uh, biobank resource has been actively used by about 20,000 uh, research uh, users internationally. And finally, I'd like to touch on uh, the topic of whether wearable measurements are trustworthy. Um, so can we trust machine learning when it's used in clinical medicine uh, in general? So, and what's really prompted this then was a very uh, thought-provoking article published in Science uh, about two years ago, uh, showing that a small change to an input uh, can cause very uh, uh, large and highly confident changes to an associated prediction. And the uh, scenario here is around uh, trying to detect uh, benign versus malignant skin lesions. So on the left, uh, we've got a, an image of a benign growth uh, and a trained uh, neural network was, uh, as we can see down the bottom there, very confident with, with a blue line is uh, almost completely full, that this is a benign tumour or benign growth rather than malignant growth. However, then, if one adds uh, an imperceptible amount of noise to the image, so if I compare the image to the right, my adversarial example versus my original image to the left, to the human eye, there are no noticeable differences. But just making this very small change uh, to the input image suddenly changed the output of the machine learning classifier to be highly confident that this is now a malignant um, uh, skin growth uh, rather than a benign uh, skin growth. So this has got lots of implications then, but can we really trust machine learning methods? And additionally, reproducible ability of machine learning in healthcare is recognized as a huge challenge. Uh, in the top right uh, at the Alan Turing Institute uh, in the UK have developed a very nice uh, two by two tables saying what we mean when we're talking about reproducibility versus replication versus robustness versus generalizability. 
and reproducibility is really the lowest bar to entry, but uh, it's frequently not achieved within the fields of uh, uh, healthcare. Um, so, and there are numerous examples of this, um, uh, whereby in the field of neuroimaging, uh, when trying to complete the same task using different analysis tools on the same data set provides widely different results. Uh, and also, uh, particularly in the medical domain, data sharing is often very difficult, but then that, that really does restrict and hinder model development. Uh, and, and there are a number of opinion pieces in, for example, JAMA, one of the uh, key journals in our field, then talking about the challenges of reproducibility of machine learning models in healthcare. And furthermore, um, uh, our, my colleagues in Oxford have uh, conducted numerous uh, systematic reviews of the evidence base. Um, so there are very clear reporting guidelines when one is doing risk prediction in, uh, in, in uh, healthcare, uh, whereby key attributes should be uh, reported as some of which are uh, uh, detailed on the left-hand side of this slide. And quite often when people are developing machine learning methods, uh, they come into the fields and have a lot of excitement, but they aren't uh, following some of the fundamentals and reporting some of the fundamentals. And that therefore means that quite often uh, such models are therefore just not picked up or used by the medical research community uh, because we haven't been able to fully evaluate whether such models are helpful or not. So there's clear reporting deficiencies in the field. Uh, and finally, uh, reproducibility within the machine for machine learning within the healthcare field lags well behind other fields. So a recent paper published in Science Translational Medicine uh, compared how well uh, technical reproducibility, statistical reproducibility, and uh, replicability uh, across multiple data sets. Um, as to how ingrained such practices and cultures are in the machine learning for health field versus the uh, natural language processing and general machine learning fields. Uh, and essentially, the machine learning for health field uh, is significantly underperforming in other fields too. So we, uh, in many ways, uh, really ought to get our act together. So uh, in, in the UK, then, we've got a national project uh, uh, funded by uh, an entity called Health Data Research UK that is really trying to work hard on this problem of can reproducible machine learning be embedded in health data science to support trustworthy clinical insights. And there are four main challenges uh, that we are working on nationally. Uh, first of all, how should researchers report machine learning and health data science? How can we help people better report and share the work that they do? Data sharing is a big problem. So can we use synthetic data sets or think of other ways uh, to share data so that we, so we can evaluate the stability of machine learning models? Thirdly, quite often healthcare researchers have to, because we're working with such sensitive data, we're we have to, uh, we can only uh, access such data in very restricted safe haven environments, uh, whereby there's not access to all of the typical tools that one would have uh, on a normal uh, cluster, for example. And then finally, can we initiate a culture of reproducible machine learning? And just to very briefly share with you some of the activities we're doing, the first is we are developing a set of reporting guidelines called Tripod AI, um, and this has got uh, support and buy-in from all the major journals, your Nature's, your Lancet's, uh, Cells, JAMA, etc. Um, whereby, if a researcher is submits a new paper to those journals, uh, they will, uh, in future, then have to follow these reporting guidelines. Uh, as they have to follow reporting guidelines for other more classical uh, medical statistics um, projects. So uh, we're currently in the process then of developing this international consensus um, document reporting guidelines for risk prediction methods that use AI tools. And uh, we've already published uh, some uh, thought pieces on this in both uh, The Lancet and the British Medical Journal. 
Uh, secondly, the human activity recognition data sets I talked about, the camera data set, we have worked to make that now freely uh, and openly available for the entire uh, human activity uh, recognition community. So this uh, data set, uh, if you are particularly interested in it, using the links below, you can now uh, go ahead and download uh, this data. We haven't made the camera images available, but we have made the labels for the images available, along with all the raw accelerometer data. Uh, so it's uh, very much our anticipation that this uh, will be uh, an important uh, and useful uh, data set for the wider research community. And just to wrap up very soon, then uh, uh, working within restricted data safe haven environments, uh, we've been able to uh, develop uh, practices uh, and tools uh, to improve risk prediction for patients who are at high likelihood of being readmitted to hospital or not. And this has already been uh, uh, implemented into clinical practice uh, within Scotland, uh, whereby we developed an ensemble of machine learning classifiers to uh, predict a risk of being readmitted to hospital. This is work led by Catalina Lejos in the University of Edinburgh. And finally, we're working uh, with, for example, the UK Biobank that I said is used by 20,000 registered research users worldwide uh, to uh, make training materials available uh, that, that uh, is available on their cloud computing system that's hosted in an Amazon environment. Again, trying to help train younger researchers uh, and, and early career researchers uh, on the uh, reproducible practices when performing machine learning, particularly in time series accelerometry data. So my second last slide, um, we can ask, where are we going next? Well, we, we have now got, uh, we will be developing new phenotypes, particularly around better measurements of sleep and steps. Uh, we, of course, use the plan better sensors uh, and newer sensors in the future, such as ECG for heart rate, uh, working with uh, industry partners um, to uh, take on board the developments that they have. Uh, and also, uh, we'll be working on uh, drug discovery uh, by integrating genetics with wearables. So to finish, uh, these are the three areas I believe that wearables uh, can uh, contribute to uh, forging our understanding, in fact, transforming our understanding, particularly of cardiovascular disease. And in particular, I believe that uh, wearables need to be embedded in larger studies in future. And a key requirement is that we use reproducible machine learning practices to measure behavioral phenotypes in wearables. And finally, if I've excited anyone in this talk, uh, we are uh, hiring uh, new posts uh, around machine learning and genomic discovery. Uh, so please do keep an eye out on our website at the Big Data Institute at Oxford uh, for uh, any vacancies that might soon be coming up. And with that, thank you very much for your attention and thank you for the invite to speak again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I then for sharing so much with us your project. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, I can hear you fine. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, okay, uh, it's very interesting, and it's uh, it's good to know that uh, UK has um, uh, the data that you can use. Yes. Um. So it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, it's, you know, it's very difficult for us to get data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, yes, all, all of the data that I presented today is um, uh, any researcher around the world can apply uh, for access to. And it's good that it's a UK, uh, part of UK population data, right? Um, it is on, uh, so when, for example, the UK biobank studies on half a million people, of course, there's, it's pretty representative of the UK population, but as with many healthcare studies, there are some uh, biases with it um, because it still is a volunteer study. So you see people who are a little bit more healthy, um, a little bit more wealthy uh, are likely to uh, to volunteer to be in such studies. But um, on the whole, it is uh, representative of the UK population. I, I just bought a watch. I can even know my <laughs> oxygen level, you know? I can check my oxygen level. 
to make sure it's at least 95% and above. <laughs> and I can see my sleep patterns. Yeah. So a lot of us here in Malaysia are wearing the Fitbit watch. Okay. Or, or this uh, okay, sensible watch that can you know, check our oxygen level, right? Our activity, how many miles we walk, how many steps we take in a day. You know? Yeah. Well, a, a key um, uh, uh, question of, often then, so, so we have unashamedly used uh, research grade uh, sensors. So they're not as pretty as an Apple Watch or a Fitbit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a key requirement for us is that they record raw acceleration data um, rather than maybe a proprietary output. Um, so, you know, for example, one has got a Fitbit and it uh, says you did so many steps today. Fitbit mm -hmm. might change their algorithm uh, in three months' time. And then it's very hard to know which version of the device the person has. And then mm -hmm. is the, the inference of steps on the next mm -hmm. version uh, consistent with the previous version. Uh, so there's quite a few unknowns about that. Um, so hence for our studies, we've been quite conservative and went with uh, just recording the raw acceleration. And then mm -hmm. that means we can uh, essentially perform uh, our analysis then on the raw data. So as mm -hmm. new and better methods become available, we can then reapply them on our existing data sets. Mm -hmm. But certainly there's a huge excitement um, around being able to potentially use commercial devices because you said they, they do have some new uh, sensors that can identify potentially important attributes of health. Um, but then what we really need is to embed these within these large healthcare studies um, because the, the biggest use of sensors then is can they help predict what will happen to someone in the future and for that then we need to follow them up for quite a number of years. I see. So th this sensor is, uh, this sensor device was developed by a group? Um, this is uh, was developed by a, a small startup company in Newcastle in the northeast of England. Um, but to be fair, there are uh, similar type of devices, um, uh, for example, developed um, recently with some of our colleagues in, in China um, and uh, a device called the Matrix device. And also there is a, a device developed in the USA called the Actigraph device. So there's a few different devices, but from our point of view, the main thing is do they record raw uh, acceleration data? And ideally, they should have a couple of other sensors on board as well. Okay, thank you. Let's open uh, okay, uh, the floor uh, to the participants. Uh, do you have any question for Professor Aiden? Victoria? Yes, uh, hi. Yeah, hi, Victoria. How are good you? to see you. Good. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you, Dr. Adnan, for a uh, good presentation and uh, good knowledge. Yeah, I have, it's not like just a question or uh, uh, for uh, uh, machine learning, you're encouraging now machine learning with uh, medicine uh, research. So, Sorry, I'll let you finish your question. Yeah, yeah. So I see from your, your slide, so you're working in the machine learning with, uh, with medicine. So that means you're encouraging uh, most of the researcher to do this uh, machine learning with uh, with. Uh, with medicine. So the question is why? No, this is not right. Then uh, you mentioned about, uh, I can't hear clearly actually when you mentioned about Cox model and uh, local logistic model. So is it useful or not useful? So I'm not so sure what, 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 what you try to, uh, uh, to say here. And then okay. how, how we relate uh, um, uh, now with the new technology, so with the big data and machine learning. So how we link machine learning to statistics actually. Yeah, this is my, my, my question. So we have a lot of research here, I think. They would like to hear this actually. Thank you so much actually, yeah. Uh, fabulous, thank you for those questions. So we'll go through them in turn. So the first one is why, um, uh, or, or, or do, do I think uh, everyone sh should be using machine learning and clinical medicine. So my, uh, direct answer to that is no, um, but it can be very helpful in particular use cases. So if one is dealing with a classical tabular data, and for example, trying to form risk prediction, uh, there are now a number of studies out there showing that machine learning methods do not outperform traditional 
for example, logistic regression methods. So machine learning, I don't believe is I, I don't believe it's helpful for classical tabular data. However, when dealing with uh, high dimensional uh, modalities such as imaging or uh, high frequency time series data from wearables, areas where it's typically very difficult to uh, get handcrafted features from, uh, those are the areas then that machine learning could be helpful. But it's incredibly important that we robustly and rigorously evaluate uh, the, the methods then to see whether they work. And that requires uh, collaboration and from machine learning or statistical experts with uh, classical medical statisticians or epidemiologists. Um, so it's it's a kind of a yes and no answer to that first question. Then the second question then was uh, around sort of providing some detail on the Cox uh, regression method versus a method I, I mentioned to potentially replace that called compositional data analysis. Um, so, so this uh, is not using machine learning, I should first of all say, so it's then for an or for a, a population, you've got the amount of time they spend asleep in sedentary behavior and in let's say moderate activity. And um, if I use a typical Cox regression method, so I've got these three um, uh, essentially variables on the population. Uh, if I want to see the benefits of doing more moderate activity, I have to, or, or I assume that I have a unit increase, let's say an hour extra of moderate activity but I assume I keep my sleep and sedentary time constant, but then that means I'm assuming that the day is 25 hours long rather than 24 hours long. So the compositional data analysis has been, I guess, kind of a traditional method, mostly using the geology domain, um, uh, as uh, essentially takes into account that so it reduces the amount of time spent in these two because to increase the amount of time spent in the moderate to vigorous uh, intensity activity. Um, so, so again, I don't advocate that machine learning replaces Cox regression. And then the final question was, uh, should the machine learning community then, uh, um, I guess, maybe more proactively uh, interact uh, with the st statistical inference community, and particularly the medical statistics community? Um, uh, to that, my I'm going to give quite a generic answer is, well, yes. Um, uh, and particularly within the uh, medical domain, there have been lots of examples, uh, particularly within COVID-19, of uh, people in maybe computing and um, machine learning getting very excited about trying to develop some method but then testing it on a woefully small data sets um, whereby you, know, one, you can't really do, I think, proper statistical inferences when you've just got a small data set of less than 100 individuals um, where maybe only one or two events occur. Um, so, so, so therefore, it's very important for people who are enthusiastic about working within the healthcare community to interact uh, with epidemiologists, medical statisticians, um, because more often than not, we are always very delighted to collaborate with people who've got a deep uh, technical expertise. I hope that has covered your three questions and apologies for my very long answer to that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Faiz, for your question. Dr. Faiz is from Qatar University. <laughs> He's the head of the program of Masters of Statistics oh. program, an old friend of mine. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank good. you for joining us, and Professor Aiden, thank you for getting up so early in the morning, okay, to, to be with us and to share with us so much. And um, okay, uh, this is uh, the beginning. We look forward to more future work with you, All right? Okay, we will right. write to you soon. And um, due to yes. due to time constraint, I I could not allow more questions, but I'm sure they can write to you if they want to know more, All right? Yes, very welcome to do so. Yes, very happy so, to answer. Any I will. Then let me uh, pass over to Miss Mora, all right? Okay, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to Associate Professor Dr. Aiden Doherty and Professor Dr. Yap Yua. We sincerely enjoy your speech and we would like to give uh, Professor Doherty a certificate of appreciation as our gratitude for your time. I'm sure it's still early in the morning now in the UK. And we will take a photo with Professor Doherty. I will count until three. And please to the committee to take the photo. One, two, three. 
thank you and thank you. i suppose yeah thank I you suppose, again yeah <laughs> everyone please give us your thumbs up and applause reactions for professor dohati thank you very much everyone and also thank you for the pretty interesting discussion afterwards i very much enjoyed it thank you bye-bye thank you okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are now about to have the last paper presentation session. That is track four, machine and statistical learning will begin shortly in the main room. The moderator for this track is Dr. Santi Pulan Purnami from Institute of Technology 10 November. Please, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the presentations, but don't forget to be back with us because we will have the awardings and a closing ceremony right after the sessions. To Dr. Santi Pulan Purnami, 